Welcome back to a weekend edition of On Texas Football. I'm CJ Vogel, joined today by Dangle. Y'all know him on YouTube, Twitch, t- uh, Twitter, everything. The big man on, on today for On Texas Football. We're talking the NFL draft, so we had to bring in the expert that we know that follows Texas recruiting, Texas football, the draft itself. It's a perfect world here, first and foremost. We're getting busy. I mean, the draft is, uh, what, 20 days away? Less than three weeks coming up here. Uh a lot of Longhorns in the conversation now to start their NFL career, more so than we've ever seen. Uh, and, and Bengal, I wanted to start it off with this because it, it has been a bit of a changing of the guard in terms of Texas joining, you know, the kind of the, the production and development elites in the world of college football when it comes to the Ohio States, the Alabamas, the Georgias, the teams that consistently send guys to the league. With the way that this draft is kind of shaping up for Texas – I mean, is it possible you see, in in your eyes, 10 potential Longhorns hearing their name called uh, uh, this year in the NFL draft? Yeah, it's definitely a possibility. I mean, Texas, obviously, this is the standard, is producing NFL talent. Had a big drop-off in there, but this is as talented of a class as we've seen in many, many years. I know everyone was giving Texas fans grief. Oh, nobody drafted this year. So, yeah, because they all came back, and now this is what we're seeing. We have multiple projected first round picks, multiple, even more inside the top 50 or top 75, top 100. This is a really good group of Texas players. And as we know, it's always super fun to watch these guys in the NFL. And there are some really, really good ones this year. Yeah, absolutely. I guess we'll start with kind of that top end of the draft because it it, it has been quite a while since you've heard Texas have multiple guys in the first round. Obviously, Bijan kind of broke a, a lengthy drought there as well. But when you start looking at some of the mock drafts, whether it be Matt Miller, Daniel Jeremiah, or some of these other guys that you know certainly make their name off of the draft and their expertise of you know creating these mock drafts, you see two or three Longhorns in that first round. You know, I think Byron Murphy and AD Mitchell right now, for the most part, are in that conversation. Xavier Worthy is the interesting one to me, and having broken that four-two-one, uh, you know, forty-yard dash combine record, that was pro. Four, the you know that was that happened after the last time that we talked. So we've yet to get your take there, but I wanted to get your your take on whether or not Texas does find themselves with a third Longhorn in the first round because, you know, that's a speed te- the NFL necessarily hasn't seen before. Yeah, it's definitely a possibility, and we know a lot of teams need receiver, especially at the back end of that first round. You look at the Chiefs. They're a team that is dealing with some off-the-field stuff with Rasheed Rice right now, and their receiving room was not great even before that. The Ravens could continue to build a track team around Lamar Jackson yes. and get Xavier Worthy in that mix. There are a lot of teams down there. Buffalo, potentially, they lose Gabe Davis to Jacksonville in free agency. How about a field stretcher like Xavier Worthy that, as we know as Texas fans, he can work underneath. He can catch screens. He's a fantastic route runner. He's great after the catch. This is more than just the fast guy. Xavier Worthy is a football player, and it would not shock me to see him in the first round. I also think there's a chance... And maybe not a great one, but I think there is a chance Tavondre Sweat could push in that group. We do see nose tackles sometimes drafted in the first round. It's a little bit more rare, especially nowadays, but it is possible. Mozzie Smith from Michigan was a first-round pick as a nose tackle uh, to the Cowboys a year ago. So there's a possibility, but I think two is probably the likelihood. Three is what we'd hope for. Yeah, I think my Cowboy friends back home would have, you know, something stern about Mozzie Smith and the way that his rookie year went. But anyways, to that point, it is interesting because our guy Rod Babers likes pointing out the defensive tackle spot has become one of those prized positions on the field. You pay those guys a lot because they have huge impacts on the game. You talk about what Aaron Donald's done in the past, Chris Jones and his impact for the Chiefs. You know, I I think right now you're looking at a guy like Byron Murphy saying, yeah, his spot's probably solidified anywhere from that 14 to 20 range, maybe up to the 23s if so. Uh, The the pick I am looking at the most, and I have this on the mock draft uh, that I released earlier this week on On Texas Football, is pick 23. And I know it's not necessarily uh, the, you know, one that you'd see fit for Jim Harbaugh, but they just traded away Keenan Allen. They let Mike Williams walk. You're looking at a group right now of receivers for Justin Herbert that probably doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in that offense to put up points. Quint Johnson being your number one returner coming back, Joshua Palmer, Darius Davis. It's not an imposing group. Is that, is LA, you know, and 
Justin Herbert, a possibility for a guy like A.D. Mitchell at 23 or even them trading back to get some value back and re- getting a- Xavier Worthy perhaps. And, and keep in mind, Joshua Palmer only under contract for 2024 as yep. well. So it's really only Quentin Johnston and Darius Davis, as you mentioned, uh, for the 2025 season. But yeah, in this scenario, the Chargers would trade back, I'm assuming, with the Vikings who would pick up the number five overall pick. But you, you wouldn't mind that. Adonai Mitchell with Justin Herbert would be a phenomenal combo. And you have Adonai Mitchell with legit wide receiver, one upside in an offense. And he would be as productive as anybody with Justin Herbert. And I know Mitchell, we could say underutilized, maybe a little bit of Texas, but also if he wasn't the number one read in the progression, maybe effort wasn't a hundred percent there as well. But the upside, when we saw it, when he was the featured receiver, he was an unbelievable player. When Texas needed a big play, they went to Adonai Mitchell and he produced, you know, you look at that, that bomb uh, down the sideline for 50 yards, Texas backed up to their own end zone. Uh, and that was a, a huge play in the Texas season. Really? You could argue that if Adonai Mitchell doesn't catch that jump ball early in the year, they're not playing for a college football uh, playoff uh, appearance at all. So I yeah, love, I, love Mitchell. It's a, it's a great point, you know, in the sense that he didn't necessarily have those games. I would jump off on a game log and say, all right, yeah, you know, we know he's going to go for eight receptions and 120 yards. He, he, he only averaged close to about four receptions per game. Doesn't feel like a lot, but when the ball was headed his direction, you, you could certainly see the talent was there. I wanted to ask you, because again, we haven't talked since the combine, 4-3-4 in the 40-yard dash for A.D. Mitchell. Do you know he had that in him? Because personally, I was expecting somewhere maybe in the high 4-4s. Four I actually think I you know, I got roasted on Twitter for my take, and hopefully uh, this our tweet doesn't you know, end up on this screen here. Matthew, I'm looking at you. But uh, I actually had him as a 4-5-1, as that was my prediction. I'm way off. I was way off for Xavier Worthy as well. So 4-3-4 uh, four, four to me feels like you can use a, an extra gear, at least get an extra gear out of A.D. Mitchell at the next level. Yeah, I, I thought he would probably be somewhere in the the mid to high four fours. I was thinking maybe you know four four seven. And you're splitting hairs versus a four four seven versus a four five one versus a four four four. But four three three four three four is not playing around. That's big no. time speed. And when Adonai Mitchell says at the combine, "Hey, I was out there running eighty five percent, so I could stay on the field for longer," you go, "Okay, maybe he does have four three in this bag." So definitely a surprise to see him run quite that fast and. He added 10 pounds. This is a guy that played around 195 at Texas, goes to the combine at 205, although not quite as tall as maybe we expected, only about 6'2 compared to the 6'4 he was listed. But uh, yeah, tremendous athlete, tremendous upside. And I was a little bit surprised to see the 4'3'3 or 4'3'4, that's for sure. Yeah, those uh, those team roster measurables, especially here at Texas, we can kind of dissect those a little differently. You know, if you know what I mean, Xavier Worthy being listed at six one, uh, maybe not. Uh, but anyways, to the point, I, it I happens to- everywhere though. Like Roman Wilson from Michigan was listed a little over or six foot or six one, and he came in at five ten at the combine. It's like they just lie or they measure yeah. him in cleats. Uh, going back to Rod Babers, I hate to keep doing this, but Rod tells us his story all the time. The Texas roster had him above 6'1", right at six foot. Uh, goes to the combine. Scott's are like, yo, man, 5'10". What are we looking at here? So uh, to each – I mean, I'm sure it's a, a, a not the, the most pleasant conversation for these guys to be having with NFL scouts and the biggest interview of their lives, but they do get multiple opportunities. And I did want to go back to one of the biggest risers in my – 2.0 mock draft. That was Jatavian Sanders. And I know we've had the discussion in the past about how much stock to put in the combine and pro day evaluations. You know, it's one of those, you know, nitpicky things that, you know, I, I think a lot of couch experts look at and say, oh, well, he, he ran a four seven. You can't have him on Sundays. But for Jatavian Sanders, I think it's at least warranted kind of the, the confusion or at least the questioning. You know, he, he didn't bench very well, only eight reps. You know, he, he jumped a 29-inch vertical, a 9-6 broad jump. Those numbers are going the opposite way in which you hope for a guy like Jatavian Sanders, a day two pick, to end up putting numbers on the field. Is that a, a, a big red flag, no red flag? I mean, you, you got to have at least anticipated a little bit better numbers than that. Yeah, I thought he would test a little bit better. I wouldn't say it's a red flag necessarily, but it's a little bit concerning. I don't like to overreact to the numbers because yeah. I think what's on film is the most important thing, right? 471 or whatever he ran, 469 is still like 75th or 80th percentile for uh, 40 times among tight ends. I think you worry a little bit more about the 
uh, Vert there because Vert, broad jump, these are tests for explosiveness. And for a guy where his calling card is his athleticism, that starts to be a little bit concerning when he's not polished as a blocker. He's not polished as a route runner. He's just really been that that big speed guy for Texas. But now you start to wonder, okay, is it more just Jatavion Sanders being schemed open in the Steve Sarkeesian offense, or is he making these plays based on his own ability as a player? Right. I think, you know, kind of goes hand in hand sometimes. Still like him as a player, but I mean, is he in the conversation to be the second tight end off the board still? Yeah. But is it a given like we felt for a while now? I'm not sure it's a given anymore. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Kind of diagnosing and dissecting his tape in terms of when he's schemed open and when he makes those plays. Because we've seen him make the contested catches. His the hands, hands are great. Right. No question. And I think that's where, you know, scouts will draw the line on whether or not the numbers match up to what they hoped and, how, you know, what they wanted to see versus, yeah, the tape makes sense. He's making one-handed grabs over Baylor defenders consistently. The tape against Alabama, I think you see the big plays of him running down the sideline thinking, yeah, this is the tight end, too, that I expected to come in and push Brock Bowers just a little bit. But we'll see because the draft is interesting. You never know really behind the scenes how each guy falls. Just ask uh, uh, old – was it Brady Quinn back in the day out of Notre Dame? You know, those slides happen at times. So Jatavian Sanders is interesting. I, I I wanted to jump across the ball to, to, to Vondre Sweat. You mentioned him earlier, defensive tackles. You know, you never really know what their market is and who might be, you know, reaching for a necessity out of the position on their roster versus best player available. I have him right now pick 62 to the Baltimore Ravens. And I saw you, uh, you're currently rebuilding the Ravens on YouTube as well. Go check that out. If you're, if you're a, a Ravens fan or looking to get into the Madden community, great series there. Uh, but the Ravens to me, if you could pair up a Justin Matabuke who I played in uh, against in high school, scary dude uh, with a Tavondre sweat, I feel like you're getting the best of both worlds in the sense that you still have the pass run, rushing ability of a Matabuke while freeing him up to move out to a two or a three or a three eye or a four eye technique while having your true nose with the Vondre sweat. It, it provides versatility to me. The Ravens like Longhorns. Is that a fit you see? Do you see, you know, Tavondre sweat falling out of 60, the top 60 picks as well? It's just tough to know where a guy like that's going to go because even though Tavondre sweat would shift over occasionally to the three, uh, at Texas, they would put Byron Murphy at the nose playing one or zero. Tavondre Sweat is an NFL nose tackle. There's there's no conversation there. That's what he will be. He's going to play over the center. He's going to hold blocks. That will be his entire job. You know, yep. you, you see less versatility at the NFL level compared to what guys can sometimes get away with in college. Tavondre Sweat is an incredible player, can push the pocket a little bit, but his NFL job will be eating up blocks. Michael Pierce, still in Baltimore for another season. I think they brought him back. That's a great guy to learn from. And then Tavondre Sweat can get a little bit more fundamentally sound, play with a lower pad level. He's a big dude. It's not easy to do. But learn from Michael Pierce, who's been one of the best nose tackles in the NFL over the past decade or so. Yeah, I like that fit a lot. Yeah, well, I got the check of approval there. I'm happy. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, because it, it's tough with Tavondre Sweat. And I think the question with him was the weight. You know, would he fluctuate? Would he drop? Would he stay, you know, would he gain? Right around, what, 365, right in that range is what we've seen from the Reese's Bowl uh, to the pro to the Combine to the Pro Day. NFL scouts, again, I think it'll vary depending on how much or what weight they want him to play at. I look at a guy like Vita Vea, who's at 345, right in that 350 range, who's made quite a bit of money and had quite a bit of success as a true Freak nose. athlete, to be fair. Freak fair. athlete. Fair. Uh, but coming out of that similar system that we saw with Pete Kwiatkowski at Washington, I think you can kind of look at and say they had the similar play style. Again, maybe – limited in the sense of what Tavondre Sweat could do athletically. Uh, but is there a comp that comes to mind for Tavondre Sweat off the top? Again, I don't think you see a lot of guys 360 plus that make huge impacts over a duration of an NFL career. Yeah, it, it's tough. I don't love comps because people can get caught up with the upside. You know, if you yeah. compare like, you know, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. to, oh, this, this guy's Larry Fitzgerald. And then people say, oh, he's going to be a top five player of all time. You know, it can be a little bit concerning and these guys have slightly different play styles. You know, they might have similar traits. You can see that remind you. Um, Devontae Sweat for me, I don't know if he's going to be playing at 366. That could be a problem because you talk about limited snap counts at that point. You know, 340 is already massive 
and he's got what like a, a medium sized dog uh, on top of that. Right. If he's at three sixty six, so it's uh it's pretty heavy. You probably are going to want to play your nose tackle at least twenty snaps a game, and is he going to be able to do that consistently in the NFL at three hundred and sixty six pounds? I would like to see him come down a little bit, a little bit, but we'll see what an NFL team thinks about that. Love him as a player, but could be a little bit limited. Not a bad athlete, but at 366 pounds, it's tough. Yeah, not Vita Vea. Absolutely. There's one other player on the defensive side of the ball I wanted to get your take on, and it's Ryan Watts, who, to me at least, put on a very good combine, doubled that up with a very strong performance in the pro day. And I know these numbers aren't necessarily the end all be all, but again, with a guy like Ryan Watts, the question was top end speed. Would he be able to, you know, kind of stick with guys going down the field vertically? We saw the troubles against Washington and Roma Dunes, a top five pick that we expect, but it was a, I wouldn't say recurring issue. It was always something that you had to keep in the back of your mind with Watts. Coming out running a four, th- uh, four five three, broad jumped uh, 11 1 at the pro day and also cleared 40 inches in the vertical. The explosivity is there. Question is, is the 10 yard split enough? Is that those numbers that he put up in the 40 enough uh, to combine with two years as a starter at Texas to end up being drafted? I have him in the sixth round, kind of in that back end of the Steelers. But there's always been that question of whether or not he would be a fringe guy, a for sure draft guy, or someone that you would see in the undrafted free agent market. But let me get your thoughts on Ryan Watts. I think the Steelers is the perfect spot. You know, if he's going to stick at corner, he needs to be in a press heavy scheme to utilize the length with the arms. And he doesn't necessarily have to be quite so explosive and fast. And the 40 time is great for him. Four, five, three. You know, you'd think maybe he was going to be a little bit slower than that. I just don't think the play speed is quite to that level. And that's, what's a little bit concerning. I think he ultimately ends up moving back to safety. Maybe a team, if the Steelers draft him, they're going to try him at corner for sure first. But I think ultimately his highest upside is at safety. Yeah. And I I liked your comments there about using his, his physicality and his length at the line of scrimmage. Texas did press at times, but not necessarily jam. They didn't reroute at the line of scrimmage, which to me with the guy like, Ryan Watts in the boundary, that's his strength. You know, use that length to, you know, jam and not allow guys to get into their routes early. Is that, in your eyes, when you evaluate cornerbacks and you watch the tape on them, is that something that is innate and they just know off the top? Is it something that you can see kind of the development at times whenever they change their approach at the line of scrimmage when it comes to pressing versus having free releases? You know, I'd be interested to hear what what Rod would say about this, but the single biggest difference for me between the college game and the NFL game is pressing. And it, it comes especially when I'm watching the receivers. These guys don't get a ton of opportunities versus press because not a lot of teams, as you mentioned, press. And right. for the guys that work better as these press man corners at the next level, they don't get the opportunity to show that, well, maybe we don't get the full picture on what they can become in the NFL. So when NFL teams are going to ask these guys to disrupt receivers at the line, a guy like Ryan Watts, when we look at him at Texas and we say, all right, he's had a couple of good games, played well in the Alabama game, but left a bit to be desired in some other games. Washington, to your point, I don't think yeah. any Texas defensive back played well in that game. But his his best football could be ahead of him if you look at his ability to press and, and use his length. It says it should be pretty good. He's got a really good athletic profile. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And again, it's kind of one of those weird things where at the back of the draft, it's not necessarily finding impact guys, but developmental pieces that you can eventually mold and get something out of them. Special teams specifically at a 4-5-3, you can certainly run down kickoff at that length and that size. Uh, the other guy on special teams I wanted to mention, and this is the last guy I wanted to mention, was Keelan Robinson. Because interesting, you know, there's most years you don't normally see a big market for a guy who's kind of a return specialist that played sparingly on the offense side of the ball with the new rules that the NFL adopted on the kickoff. There might be more of a market for kickoff returners. Keelan Robinson, obviously one of uh, one of the best in the country a year ago, returning kicks. 4-4-1, 20 reps in the combine at the bench press. I know it kind of pick and choosing the, 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 the top end up uh, measurables here, but uh, to me, with the way that the game's kind of evolving and these new rules coming in on the kickoff, it could be, lend a team at the back end of that draft to take a a chance or, you know, use a spot in the draft on a kickoff return specialist. 
we see it happen all the time. I mean, it's it's an underappreciated position. We see gunners get drafted. We right. see return specialists get drafted. The one that comes to mind is Kane Nwangu. We saw him at Iowa State. The Vikings drafted him, I think, maybe in the fourth round a few years ago. And he was never going to be drafted to play running back. If you are a good enough return man, you have tremendous value in the NFL. And Keelan Robinson is that is also he's been a guy that's played in punt coverage as well, right? Making tackles. So uh a great gunner, yes. This is this is somebody that has tremendous value all over the place. He's just a football player. Is he going to be an NFL running back? Maybe not. But is he going to be a long NFL pro? He's got the potential. And you can't say that of a lot of late round draft picks. But, you know, guys like like Matthew Slater of the Patriots never made any impact offensively or defensively, but have a 10 plus year career because they're so good at what they do on special teams. Yeah, interestingly enough, uh, it feels like kind of all of these fringe Longhorn special team guys that end up having successful long careers start with the Patriots. You know, you go back to Adrian Phillips, now Brendan Schooler, maybe Keelan Robinson ends up in that role. Who knows with Bill Belichick out the window now, but uh, that was something that I, I thought was very interesting looking back on. Uh, I did want to ask you this because you, I mean, Giants fan, Cowboys fan here. NFC East, a little bit interesting. You know, the Giants certainly looking to rebuild a little bit, add some extra pieces. Of this Texas draft class, you know, is there a piece that you're looking at to say, yeah, I would like to have a Jalen Ford in the middle of my defense, Devondre Sweat up front. Is there one guy that you're looking at that could certainly impact the Giants more so than uh, maybe anybody else on this Texas draft group? You know, we, we talked about this a little bit before, but I mean, the Giants could really use all of these players, which I mean, <laughs> would be a dream for me. But if the Giants, they pick at 47 in the second round, I mean, Jatavion Sanders, you could sell me on him at that point. Devondre Sweat, you could sell me on him to play nose. If, if Worthy gets there at 47, a ton of speed into the offense. If you have to trade up for Adonai Mitchell, if he sneaks into the second round, or maybe the Giants even move down from six, maybe a team moves up for a QB. The Giants decide not to go for a QB if one's available. Let's say, for example, the Vikings would trade 11 and 23, and then it's not the Chargers taking Adonai Mitchell at that spot, but it's the Giants. I'd be all in on that. It, it's tough to really just take one player here. You know, I did just before this, I did a three round mock draft show uh, with another channel. And my pick for the Giants at the top of the third round was Jonathan Brooks yeah. from Texas. He can catch the ball, he can run, obviously, great vision, great ability to make that safety miss like every time. Love Jonathan Brooks and you lose Saquon Barkley, but maybe he can be the replacement. So it's like picking your favorite, you know, child with this. I would feel I'm not, a, I'm not a father, but you know, <laughs> I, I feel like that's exactly how it would be because I love all these guys. All of them can make an impact for my favorite team in the NFL. I, I won't pick. I'll just say that. I mean, all of those guys could be tremendous. I, I, I think if you're, expecting Jonathan Brooks into that third round, you're going to have to be fighting a lot of Cowboys fans at 56 that would like to be uh, seeing a star put on his helmet next year, especially with the departure of Tony Pollard and kind of the rumors of Zeke returning to Dallas. I think a lot of folks are looking for a fresh start there, and Jonathan Brooks might provide just that. Uh, I wanted to get one more question in, and this will be our last question. Thank you again for joining us today. A little weekend edition of On Texas Football. 2025, a way too early look, but – when it comes to Quinn Ewers and the potential of him to maybe become a top five, maybe even 1.1, in terms of what's next from him and his development, is there a key element in his game that to become that guy you've got to see this year in the SEC? I need to see Quinn Ewers push the ball down the field more accurately. That That's one of the biggest things that he needs to check off. And Quinn Ewers can throw with touch. It's impressive to be able to do that. I want to see him rip some more lasers in tight windows. And yep. I don't really think Steve Sarkeesian is going to let him do that. And is that a Quinn Ewers thing or is that a product of the Steve Sarkeesian offense? But Quinn, as we talked about, you know, we, we've had private conversations. The training wheels kind of still stay on Quinn Ewers. And the potential we know is amazing. We've heard about the arm talent for so long. We saw it for a quarter against Alabama a couple of years ago. If we can get that Quinn Ewers first quarter 2022 Quinn Ewers versus Alabama for a full season, he will be the number one overall pick. Look out. Yeah. Will we get that? We'll have to see. That's yeah. that's that's a tough thing to live up to. 
especially with the brand new wide receiving corps that you got to build that rapport and that relationship with. It'll be interesting. I'm with you right now. I see him as a first round guy top end. Probably not. I think again, midway through the the regular season this year, that was ultimately the, the, the deciding factor for Quinn to return to school rather than test his draft luck uh, this year. But to each his own year three, normally you see a jump in uh, third year starting quarterbacks in the, the college game. We'll see. But Bengal, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this has been great. Uh, follow Bengal on YouTube at Bengal and on Twitter as well at Big Game Bengal. Uh, a lot of Madden uh, draft coming up. You know, the NFL draft is probably one of your favorite times of the year. It's one of mine only, you know, kind of specifying around Texas clearly. But for you, what's coming up that folks can, uh, you know, be on the lookout for? If you're in, uh, interested in an NFL draft co-stream with breakdowns, analysis of every prospect, uh, at least in the first round, I generally get to about 150 different uh, players a year when I do my film study and analysis and um, obviously read up on more than that. But yeah, first couple rounds, Bengal YouTube channel could be the place to be. If you're looking for a Texas perspective, Texas lean. There you go. Well, you, you, more, more times than not, you know, you graduate school, you get your diploma, whatever. You're done with tests. You're done with studying forever. Not, uh not when the combine and, uh, and the draft come rolling around. So uh, credit to you. Make sure to check them out. Subscribe, like, follow. Uh, this has been great. Thank you again, uh, Bengal, for joining us on On Texas Football. This has been a little weekend fun. I'm CJ Vogel, and thank you, Bengal, for joining us. Okay. Thank you.